I'll ask Strain to start the opening character here, please. Tuia ki ronga, tuia ki raro, tuia ki roto, tuia ki waho, tuia tanta ki tangata, ki te kopapa ute hui nei, ki te kopapa ute rangi nei, mauri ora ki a tanta Thank you, thank you, Dre. Uh, so just some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, welcome everyone, including those on Zoom. A uh, reminder of members of the Zoom requirements. The meeting is be recorded and will be available on Council's YouTube channel. Microphones muted. Unless speaking and hands up for questions, please. And turn your cameras off and microphone during any breaks we have. And uh, just for the, those in the room, uh, the emergency procedure of the alarm goes as we exit through those doors, out through the main doors and assemble at the rear of the armadillos. If it's an earthquake, we drop cover and hold under the desk or where we safely can. And just um, a reminder, the media are or may be present and may be forming part of all of this meeting. And just and a reminder to everyone around the table that uh, when the meeting starts through the chair, please. Um, so do we have any apologies, uh, Councillor Courtney? Yes, I have a uh, an apology. Could I say a tentative tentative apology from James Hodgson? He's yeah. got an appointment at nine, and he may be here. No, he's sick. Uh, I'm sorry, he won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's let us know that he won't be here. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Any others? I take it, Councillor Courtney. You're happy to move those apologies? Yes, I would. Thank you. Do we have a second, Councillor Dowler? All those in favour, will say aye. Against the resolution is carried. We'll move to public forum. Uh, the first speakers are Bicycle Nelson Bays, uh, Bevan Woodward, and Anne Van DM. We've got a PowerPoint. Uh, 10 minutes because you're a group and welcome. A warm welcome. And if you just uh, press the talk button on there, the microphone should come on. Kira. Kira Tato, thank you. My name is Bevan Woodward and this is Ange van der Laan from Bicycle Nelson Bays. Bicycle Nelson Bays represents people across Nelson and Tasman, people who want to safely cycle and walk and cycle to work, to study, to shop, etc. And we have approximately 2,000 supporters. We commend Tasman District and Nelson City for the work done to date on speed management the additional walking and cycling improvements we're seeing and the significant public investment, sorry, the public, the significant investment in public transport, which we commend you on. And today we wanted to share with you why we are so supportive of safe and appropriate speed limits and talk a bit deeper about just how, how powerful they are, how transformational um, safer speed limits are. So to do that, we'll just, have a quick look at the at the bigger picture of transport. Look at the um, the significant issues that we we face with our transport system, and talk to why safer speed limits are vital. They're proven, and how they actually make our transport system more efficient, more sustainable, and more affordable. Okay, here you go transport history in four easy to, to understand little cartoon. Um, so cities developed a course around walking, cycling, using a horse, and then public transport evolved. And through the years, uh, we maintained those modes of transport until around about the 1950s, when, of course, we, the, world, the world had cheap and um, uh, yeah, I guess cheap uh, automobiles available. And so really since the 1950s, the transport network has been developed on the basis that every adult has a car. Oops, let's go back one there, thank you. Um, and that children sh should really be ferried around in those cars. And this has been, of course, to the detriment of the other modes. And so in that, in that diagram in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see 
how the cycling and the walking um, networks are just little segments, little bits and pieces. And it's true, we have some really good cycling here, but we also have many gaps. And the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So people will judge walking and cycling, not, not so much always by the good stuff, but where they know it's dangerous and it's difficult to cross. And I think we all know, you know that from experience of, of what we experience here. So we, we've made it safer and more pleasant to drive the car. So where are we going with all this? We have some serious issues from our high rate of car dependency. New Zealand has the highest rate of car ownership in the world. And we have a very, very high uh, mode share use of private motor vehicles. Well, if we continue to try and build our way out of congestion, we'll only get more of what we don't want. And that is traffic congestion, emissions, air pollution, lack of travel choice, unpleasant streets full of traffic and noise. But the great thing is that we have a choice and that there is an alternative. We can enable people to use the alternative transport modes and that's where safer speeds comes into its own. It's a vital component to unlocking mode, sh mode shift. <clears throat> So on our rural, uh, sorry, on our urban streets, the magic of safer speeds, you can just see it, I think, in these two images. One of them, of course, is Nelson City, and the other is Copenhagen. And by implementing 30 kilometer an hour speed limits, you, you do away with the need for expensive and difficult infrastructure. You don't have to remove car parking. You don't have to try and squeeze in cycling facilities. If you calm everything down, it just works better for everyone. It's very low cost and it's quick to install across entire networks. It unlocks options that are currently considered unsafe. People can start thinking about walking, cycling, using their mobility devices, e-scooters, etc., as viable options to get around. So students and the elderly and commuters, kids needing to get around to see their friends. It's all about leaving the car at home and those short trips are replaced by safe, sustainable, healthy transport modes. And the great thing about it all is with mode shift is that it actually reduces the amount of traffic on the roads. So congestion, which primarily occurs at intersections, get the, the worst delays, Intersections flow better, and that re reduces travel times for motorists. So we see it as a real win-win. And considering our rural roads, the brutal reality is, is that people generally don't survive head-on crashes at 100 kilometers per hour. So, just on the physics alone, we really need to be looking at 80 kilometres an hour for all roads that are not divided. <clears throat> of course, there's more to it than just crashes, um, and, and that is um, the, the implications of, of people losing their lives, of serious injuries, and then there's the delay. And I understand that from this crash, without knowing really what caused it, but there was um, over an eight hour delay on stay, uh, a closure of State Highway 1 on, um, on, on Friday afternoon slash evening. And from a cycling perspective or walking or riding your horse or riding or cycling along 100 kilometer an hour roads is generally horrendous. So we support safer speed limits on rural roads as well. Okay, safer speeds are a global thing. They are coming. Um, this is just a, a shot from the United Nations World Health Organization. And if I just quote them, they say that livable streets made possible by low speeds are at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Low speeds are at the heart of, of what happens. 
So safe speeds, as I say, are happening around the world. I'm sure many of you have traveled and seen 30 kilometer an hour neighborhoods. Perhaps you have seen um, the 60, 70, 80K rural speeds, which are happening on streets and roads in Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Spain, across the United Kingdom. And I note that just last month that Wales went to a blanket 30 kilometer an hour urban, spread, urban speed limit. <clears throat> and Amsterdam. Thank you, Ange. <clears throat> um, now, dealing with opposition. Change of, of any sort will almost invariably generate some opposition. And that's okay because, you know, we live in a tolerant, hopefully, democratic society in which we can have different opinions. But the focus of the opposition is often on the worst possibilities. And the wider benefits can get ignored. And this happens with all manner of change. And I think about the example of the opposition to banning smoking in pubs. There were questions, who will enforce the ban? Who, who will make sure that people don't smoke in pubs? Um, pubs will go out of business. All these bad things will happen. Yet the change has come through and I think has been a pretty smooth and successful one. And I think the same things happen when we introduce safer speeds and that the opposition subsides once people get used to the changes and see the wider benefits. So to conclude our presentation, we are asking today that Nelson City and Tasman District adopt the safe and appropriate speeds, which I understand are option D and option four and what's been put before us. And just to summarize the situation, it's because safer speeds are a lot more than what they appear on the face. And that's why we start this presentation with the magic of safe speeds, that they are transformational. They enable the mode shift, they improve transport efficiency, and they make transport for all more affordable. And there's a massive issue. That's right. That's it. Thank you. In relation to transport afford affordability, there's a massive issue in being able to afford the current system. It's not working. I've talked about the key issues of, of emissions and air pollution. Health, you know, health, the single single thing that you can do if you want a longer, happier, uh, healthier life is to be active. How do you get active? You bring it into your daily life of e.g. getting to work, to, to the shops, et cetera. And finally, safer speeds are this highly cost-effective treatment which will transform our streets and our transport system. We welcome any questions and thank you for your attention. Questions are clarification for members' benefit. So, you know, Ms. Smith. I know that your group, and including today's presentation, make the comparison with Amsterdam and uh, with the Netherlands. Isn't that an unfair comparison when, if you look at the OECD studies on transport, you could not have a greater variation between the Netherlands, Amsterdam, and Nelson Nolbra in that they have a population density of over 450 people per square kilometre, the highest in the OECD, and the Nelson Marlborough Tasman region has the lowest population density of less than one hundredth of that. And so aren't the, the transport solutions for a community like ours radically different to those of an incredibly densely populated community like Amsterdam in the Netherlands that has the highest population density in the OECD? No, we don't believe so at all. Um, so Christchurch and places like Nelson, growing up here as a kid, cycling around, just masses of kids cycling to school, um, even lower density than what we have today. So no, we don't think density is an issue. Um, and if you introduce e-bikes into the equation, then density go, uh, problems really largely go away. Sure. <clears throat> Yeah, so we're here today around speed limits. So in terms of population density and infrastructure, yep, that is an issue. Uh, but 
in terms of speed limits, that is the single biggest thing we can do in this community to make our roads safer. It's not about population density, it's about livability and safety. It's a cheap, it's a cheap solution. And I encourage you to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Stuart. Thank you, um, Bevan and uh, Anne, for coming along and giving of your time today to share with us your views on this. Um, you mentioned, Bevan, in your talk, talk about um, uh, gaps in Nelson and Tasman's uh, cycle, way, cycle network. Can you give me just one, please, for, for Nelson that you see? Probably the one that we hear most about is when you come off the railway, railway reserve and you cycle down St Vincent Street, then getting into the CBD, Gloucestershire, Hardy Street, is really, really unpleasant cycling. You don't want to be there on a bike. Thank you. No, not into comments. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Bevan. Thank you, Ange. Thank you we'll move on to the next speaker, which is Patrick Shortley, continuer issue of road safety in Matamoti. Five minutes, Patrick, and I'll give you an indication at four and a half minutes. So, a warm welcome and thank you. Good morning and thank you all. Sorry, my voice is a little hoarse this morning. Some of you may uh, recognise me. I am a fairly uh, frequent visitor to these hallowed halls. Um, banging the same drum, we are trying desperately to get attention, priority attention, to reducing speeds outside Nardamoti School. I personally have been making submissions on this for over 20 years. I know that many others have been too. To date, we're getting absolutely no traction on the issue. Now, we recognise that the uh, speed management plan is, is in, in process, and we recognise that it is due to come into force in uh, 2024. Um, the difficulty that we see is that basically uh, it isn't due to be completed until the end of 2027. And that's basically four more years of um, just a, a, an untenable situation. The speed limit outside an automotive school and, and the, the school boundary fence is one and a half metres from the highway, uh, is 100 kilometres per hour. Um, the side road, Green Hill, um, which runs up, is also a 100 kilometre an hour road. You would you wouldn't drive it at that speed. What we're asking for basically is sensible priority to be given on the basis of a risk assessment. We note that other schools in the district, all of the other schools in the district have speed restrictions around them already. There is no other school in the Tasman district that has a 100 kilometer highway directly past its front gate. Um, and as I say, we're getting absolutely no traction. So I spoke with uh, the committee last in October. Since then, I've written to the um, uh, to, to the council and have been told that it is impossible to give um, un, um, uh, uh, specific attention to the one issue of the Nardamoti school because it would require a parallel process, which frankly is quite, is simply unbelievable. Uh, in the last six months that I know that the speed management plan has been going on, um, the uh, Rudolf Steiner School in Motueka has received its Kura signs, its speed restrictions. So it's clearly possible to, uh, to give priority to, to, to um, and we're not looking for special favors. We're not looking for anything, um, that would disadvantage any other school. What we're asking for, and what we have been asking for repeatedly for years, is that a sensible assessment of risk in our neighbourhood be undertaken and that plans and actions follow from that. And that really is all I need to say on the subject. 
I sincerely hope that the committee can exercise some influence over so that basically we get priority within the state management plan. We're not asking for a parallel process. We're asking for priority in accordance with the level of risk that our children face. And the possibility of there being another 760 school days that our kids have to cross a 100-kilometre highway without crossings, without um, footpaths or anything else, is really an untenable situation. So thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to, again, bang this drum. And I apologise to those of you who are probably thoroughly bored with with my presence here to, uh, today. Thank you. Do we have any questions of clarification, uh, Mayor Smith? This is the first presentation I've heard from Nati Moti and welcome, and it's not within my area, but I am interested. The specific solution that the Nati Moti School and its community is seeking, as I know quite a number of our communities have those flashing lights that operate specifically around school times and bring it right down to 30. What is the preferred uh, solution for the speed limit? Is it one of those sorts of systems or what's the proposition that the community and school would prefer? I can't really speak on behalf of the entire community or the school uh, because I haven't simply haven't cleared that with them. Um, I, I think that that's a process that will will evolve in, in hopefully over the next very short while. Uh, during the consultation process with uh, with officials. I don't think it's necessary for the speed to be reduced to uh, 30 kilometres now. Personally, I would think that um, a Kura signs 60 kilometres an hour and, yeah, possibly 40 kilometres an hour during a uh, world whilst children are present. But I know that, you know, that's very, it's going to be very difficult to enforce in our area. Uh, thank you, Jane. I'm just wondering if you might be able to explain the um, what the likely would outcome would be, and just how long we had to do something at Natamoti School, if you could, for the benefit of the committee and Mr. Shortly. Sure, Chair. While well, Jane's sitting up with her, um, um, if if you have a header in your head or available quickly by reference, it would be useful to explain. I think the the solution for or the proposed outcome for Nati Moti is common to options A through to D or very similar. Yeah, that's so correct. if you could explain that to the committee, that would be helpful too. Thank you. Um, so uh, for sorry, apologies, I can't quite remember the name of the small. Is it School Road, Green. Green Hill Road? Um, for each of the options, option. One through to option four, Green Hill is would be permanently dropped to thirty, um, and for the for the uh, Motueka Valley High, uh, high um, Highway Highway, yes. <laughs> um, that would be dropping to sixty under all options from the bridge. Oh, I can't remember the name of the Peninsula Bridge. Peninsula, Peninsula Bridge, Bridge yeah. to River Haven, so at uh, the other side of the school. So it would be sixty. Um, but that that would come into place once the plan was approved. So we've, we're looking at July for that, but then the implementation would could happen from that approval. Implementation could be given. Is there not some requirement for us to have schools done by a certain date? Um, there is, but we've, because the plans dates were extended, we've asked for an exception from Waka Katahi to right. enable that. And it, it's only a certain percentage, it's 40% of the schools. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it is within the committee's scope to recommend the timing of implementation of whatever speed management plan option they came up with to the joint committee. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shortley. Hey, Frank. Um, Kate, welcome. And yeah, once again, five minutes, and I'll give you a warning at four and a half. We never got to that with Mr. Shortly, so yeah, we like to yeah, yeah, go to Katoa. My name's Kate Malcolm. First, I'd like to express my appreciation of the bus ride from the airport to uh, into Nelson City. 
uh, not only of the dramatic views, but also of the skill and care of the drivers. For a visitor to Nelson, that would be a very, very interesting way to arrive. Of course, most travellers get to and from the airport by car. That's reflected in the enormous car park. The bike shed, by contrast, is only about the size of a bus stop. And as far as I know, there's no secure bike storage at the airport. But recently, a spur of the Great Taste Trail has been completed that carries cyclists from the airport to Tahunanui, going through, you can see that red line on the map, going through the golf course and skirting the back beach and the campground, a pleasant and peaceful off-road ride. At the Nelson City end, an off-road bike path was completed some years ago, linking, you can turn it off now, linking the Mai Tai Riverbank with Wakefield Quay. If only these two safe paths could be joined up, you were talking about a gap earlier. Bevan was asked, is there a gap? Well, the most glaring gap is surely the stretch along Rocks Road between Tahunanui and Wakefield Quay. If only these two existing paths could be joined up with a safe recreational bike path along Rocks Road. People have wanted this for so long. Are you up to the challenge of actually making it happen? Could you create, as you have with the bus ride, an interesting, memorable, possibly unique and certainly imaginative way to arrive in our city from far-flung parts of the world and New Zealand? Start by visualising the airport with not only a car park, a taxi stand and a bus stop, but also a rank of cargo bikes for hire that air travellers could choose as a way of continuing their trip in a healthy and sustainable way. Then visualise a stream of cyclists zooming along Rocks Road and giving extra value to existing paths that are currently underutilised dead ends. From the airport to the Mai Tai River, what could be better? This project, safe recreational biking along Rocks Road, possibly with extra finance from the Provincial Infrastructure Fund, could be, and in my opinion, should be, your priority for the coming year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kate. Any questions of clarification? Please not. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So we'll move on now, councillors, to um, members, uh, to declarations of interest. Any call, uh, any one, any new interest to declare? He is not. We'll move on to items uh, confirmation of minutes. Minutes of the Joint Nelson Tasman Regional Transport Committee meeting held on Friday, 22nd, 7th of October, 2023, be confirmed as a true and correct record of the meeting. Would someone like to move? Move Councillor Dowler. Do we have a seconder? Councillor O'Neill Stevens. All those in favour will say aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Uh, that the minutes of the extraordinary Joint Nelson Tasman Regional Transport Committee meeting held on Monday the 20th of November 20th be confirmed as a true and correct record of the meeting. Someone happy to move? Move Councillor O'Neill Stevens, second Councillor Dowler. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Against. Resolution is carried. Thank you. We'll move on to reports, and the first one is the Draft Regional Land Transport Plan 2024-34, LTP and Regional Public Transport Plan. Um, on page seven, Alec, and you're welcome, and you've got a team there with you. Um, thank you to the Chair. Um, we'll take the report as read, and um, I will let Rhys um, Palmer um, talk to the specifics and give you a, a brief overview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome, Rhys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, through the Chair. So I'll just run through a few um, key points of both the Regional Land Transport Plan and the 
regional public transport plan, which are in draft in the agenda um, with the key purpose today to approve those to go forward and seek uh, community views. Um, and uh, before we get into discussion, I'll just sort of just do a quick uh, overview of, of, of where we're at at the moment. So the both documents are uh, six-year documents and you update them every three years. So we're in the, in the, in the, in the update mode, the midterm review for the RLTP, um, but the regional public transport plan is a, is a, is a new document. So in updating the regional land transport plan, previously that included Marlborough. So we have removed the, the references to Marlborough where that was um, where that wasn't applicable to keep them in. Um, we've updated the tables, we've updated some of the data. We haven't done a full rewrite and updated all of the narrative. So it's been you know, a reasonably light update, I think would probably be the best way to describe it. Um, it's also, as we discussed in our last workshop, um, at the moment we're really challenged by the regional land transport plan has to be in alignment with the GPS. This is drafted on the basis of the GPS under the previous government, um, and that obviously creates some challenge. And we are unable to meet the legislative timeframes if we wait for the new government's government policy statement. So in order to try and, I guess, move forward and, and remove some of that risk and potentially some of the churn when we do get a new government policy statement, we have included on page 52 um, a table called On the Horizons. And what we have done in page 52 is put in several projects that have been considered um, in previous business cases, so from the Nelson Future Access, business case specifically and the Richmond program business case. So we've put some projects in there that haven't been put forward by either Wakakotahi or Nelson or Tasman for fiscally constrained reasons. We'll put them in that table. So should funding things change under a new GPS, we would be able to potentially bring them forward without having to go out and re-engage with the community because we'll be signaling to them, hey, we've got some projects kind of in the wings. What are your views at the moment on those? So that is one way we have tried to kind of, I guess, buffer that uncertainty we are in at the moment. Um, now, at our workshop where we um, sought feedback on the prioritisation of projects, which is something that the Regional Transport Committee has to do for its significant projects. We got the feedback that you wanted a value for money consideration within that. So we took the um, benefit cost ratios that we, we had it for the projects and, and redid that prioritisation. And that had the effect of um, bringing up those commercial um, vehicle safety centres. So there was one in Hira, one in Murchison, and one in Wakefield, that brought them up that priority ranking. The rest of the projects largely stayed the same, and that is presented uh, in your agenda on page 48, that ranking of the significant projects. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, we are proposing to increase the significance, the financial value and the significance policy. I, I haven't gone back and looked, but I'm pretty sure it was 12 years ago that the $5 million limit was set, um, and we have proposed to increase that to $15 million um, in this document, in this update. Uh, and then, I guess, finally, I've sort of talked a wee bit about that, um, the uncertainty that we are in currently with the GPS. I would hope that we might be getting some early indications on the GPS at about the same time that we will be getting feedback from the community on the RLTP and provided it didn't trigger significance policy, we could take that community feedback and the new GPS and reconsider this document for going forward in its final form. And I guess I would quite like to invite Emma to maybe see whether she has any intel on the timing of the GPS that she can share with the committee. Um, 
And one last point, I guess, before we get into to questions, is up on the screen is two highlighted yellow boxes um, under Resolution 4 for the, for the Regional Land Transport Plan. Uh, there's two tables in the document that haven't been completed, and I just wanted to, I guess, highlight that we still need to complete those before we go out to the community, um, and that's something we can do this week. I just wasn't available for the agenda deadline. And in drafting the regional public transport plan, we missed the role that the Tasman Community Transport Trust plays, and we wanted to reflect that in that document too. So we've got a resolution there to add some words in there. So I guess, um, yeah, in terms of going forward, I'd be interested in Emma's view on GPS timing, if she has one, um, and then happy to take questions. Thank you, Emma. Yes, uh, we don't have a confirmed time at this stage, but we, uh, the Minister is very focused on the draft GPS, so we're expecting that that will be worked on over Christmas, and we should have a draft once uh, Cabinet's sitting again early next year. That would be February, would it? Oh, really? I met with the Minister of Transport last Monday and the indications was that it was a high priority and that they were expecting in January. I've got a, a, a three sort of elements, um, Mr Chairman, I'm happy to take them in the order you'd prefer. The first was just a technical question, but quite important on page 48, uh, and that is with respect to the total cost 10 years for the two projects. And I just wanted to check that there hasn't been a mistake, but the numbers seem to have quite dramatically moved. That is in the table on page 48. It's now listing the total cost for 10 years for the Stoke Bypass is 496 million. Has there been some dramatic change? And I noticed that previously Rocks Road was of that order and it's dropped to 104. Is that accurate or has there been an error? Uh, so the amount for the Hope Bypass, uh, I think the business case listed it as 250 million. And then in the process of Wakakatahi, when they were developing the ship, the State Highway Investment Proposal, they considered that estimate and they considered the escalation we've had since then and put that number forward in the ship. So that is taken from Wakakatahi's information that they provided to us. So I can only assume that that is correct and reflects the cost of doing business. That is correct. And the Rocks Road uh, numbers don't include the full project because it only includes the years included in the RLTP. So the reason for the $204 million on Rocks Road is because that doesn't include the construction in the 10 years. Is that correct, Emma? Or has the... I had previously seen figures of the Rocks Road shared pathway at 500 is the reason it is now 200 because there's been some change in the estimates or it's not expected to be concluded in construction within that 10 year window? I'd have to double check that, but it certainly will be a significantly more than 200 million. So it must go outside the period. Okay. And just while we're looking at that table, it seems quite incredible that Wakeford and Murchison commercial vehicle receipt regional safety centres, $14 million. It must be quite elaborate. Mm -hmm. right. uh, just the Wakefield and Murchison Commercial Vehicle Reg Regional Safety Centres, which is the next one down on the table, $14 million for those two facilities. Yeah, the, um, the new CBSTs are significantly developed, so they need to... Um, meet much higher safety standards for the people working at them and, and obviously the drivers yeah. pulling over at them. And um, so there may also, uh, we may also have to look at land acquisition because um, Councillor Dowler previously raised concerns about congestion at the current uh, Wakefield site and um, the team's advice that they are looking at alternative locations as well. Thank you. you had a Just a uh, follow-up is um, the previous numbers that have been publicly reported on the Hope Bypass have been, of I thought, about 250 now. 
is it possible for us to get a report? It's a very substantive shift from uh, 250 to 490. Is it possible for the Regional Transport Committee to get a brief uh, from NZTA Whakakatahi on uh, what has been the reason for that very substantive shift in its costings? It's, a, it's, it's the most important project on our list. It's a big shift in numbers. I'm not saying whether it's correct or not. I, I just think it's such a big shift that uh, it would be worthwhile us potentially at one of our future meetings, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, getting, a, getting a brief on uh, what's caused that significant cost escalation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would that be possible, Emma, to get an um, update? or? Yes. Thank you. Anything? You had one more thing. I had uh, just a commentary. In the chairman's brief at the beginning, it makes reference to the new government's greater focus on congestion reduction. I think it would be better word, and it's ultimately for you, Mr. Chairman. In the discussion I had with the new Minister of Transport, it's very much the importance to the economy of efficient transport infrastructure, and that's wider congestion. And yeah, I yeah. and I think that would be a better way yeah. uh, to express that. I agree. Yeah. The the third area is I just um, on the whole issue of the environmental and the um, emissions reduction. I'm interested um, around, in my view, absolutely pivotal for our region, with over 80% of journeys being done by vehicle is the revolution towards electric cars. Um, and quite a substantive question around the infrastructure to support that. Uh, and particularly in our more rural and remote areas, the Murchisons, um, even the, the Wakefields, the Motawakas, the Takaka. When I read through the uh, regional transport uh, plan, there's just no mention uh, at all uh, of that challenge. Now, it could be, um, this is where I'm interested in the advice from officers, um, is the issue of electric car infrastructure within the ambit of what we get to deal with in our regional land transport plan? Race. Uh, through the chair, no, the, I mean, the, the primary purpose of your regional transport plan is to put up your funding bid from the road controlling authorities to central government to seek investment. So I think if Tasman or Council or Wakakatahi were building that charging infrastructure, then it would have a role in this plan. As far as I'm aware, we're not, because it's not reflected in the AMP. Uh, in, the, in the asset management plans, so it's probably not appropriate in here. However, there is a table um, called uh, significant um, transport projects or activities that are funded elsewhere. Now, it could be that we could reflect that, try and understand who is doing what and how much it's costing, and reflect that in the plan in that particular location. Um, I don't know if other officers have yep. Can I just more they can add. Can I just push a little bit? Is the lack of any mention of electric car infrastructure because the current framework does not allow within a regional land transport plan for that issue to be addressed? Or is it because we haven't chosen to put it there? And I don't want to hold up getting this draft out for consultation, but I just think that if we are real about how we can get emissions reduction across our transport network, actually, um, my view is that the biggest gains to be made is converting the feet over to electric, and one of those barriers is the infrastructure. So my question is, can we if we want to, or does the legislation and the framework around regional land transport plans limit our capacity to go into the infrastructure questions uh, that arise from the growing use of electric vehicles? Uh, through the chair, if... If you, we can certainly talk about that lack of charging infrastructure in the plan, but to put an activity in to progress that infrastructure, you need to have one of the road controlling authorities to have financial responsibility to deliver it. So if one of the RCAs want to put their hand up and say, yep, we're going to invest in that and do it, then absolutely we can include it in the tables. Okay, thank you. Like I say, I'm, I'm not. this is a draft that's going out to consultation at this point. Uh, my view is it's light in that space of, of addressing it. There's a whole lot of talk about the sustainability issue and the environmental impacts. 
uh, but it's silent on what I think is the single biggest opportunity for us to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the transport sector is uh, the things that we can do to improve the uptake of electric vehicles. And that is something that I'll uh, continue as we go through the process of the development and as we look at the alignment with the new government's uh, GPS. Thank yeah. you, Tom. Yeah. yeah, through the chair. I mean, it, it's a good question. I mean, and, and the, I guess the, the view um, that the council is currently taking, I'm, I'm not going to speak on Nelson's behalf, I'll speak on perhaps Tasman's, is that particularly charging infrastructure um, is a, either a network issue or an issue of the private sector to provide the facilities, just like BP and Caltex and so on do for internal combustion engines. So I guess the question is, for the councils is whether they see themselves or Waka Kotahi see themselves as a provider of that particular type of kit in the future, or whether they leave it to the private sector. Um, there are some already well-identified gaps in network infrastructure um, in the South Island that make provision of, of charging infrastructure challenging in some places, like Springs Junction was one of those. Um, but I believe that through um, separate government intervention, and previously they've started to build... Um, Greater newer capability to provide for charging infrastructure in those areas. So I guess if I come back to my main point. Um, Reese is right. If the councils want to step into that role, Waka Katahi, there's nothing prohibiting it from putting this plan. I think the thinking to date was that it's probably not the road controlling authority's role, but um, that is something that can be explored further. Just to follow on from that, we have been working with um, Gerard Logan from the Energy Efficiency and Cons Conservation Authority in regards to uh, EV charges at Lake Rotary, Eti Sonata, and also Kohata, and in fact the ones that Kohata are installed and operated. But yeah, there is a real link as um, Dwayne said at Springs Junction, just speaking of the capability to even have them there was some of the issue, because there's just not enough power from Network Tasman, and they're talking about either battery or solar backups for that uh, charging facility. Because, yeah, the Springs Junction is the real critical one. Uh, Councillor Butler. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I Just following on from that, I think it would be um, quite good to just have a statement in there about um, the, um, the position on charging. And, you know, we can't commit to anything. But it's going to be, it is of great concern to a lot of people. You know, they can't, people don't drive over to Golden Bay in their EV because there's no charger at Collingwood, for example. Um, but if we could just have some recognition that it is a topic that um, will be considered, it needs to be mentioned. That's in the document. That's my Generally, are people mind. supportive of that around the table? Okay. So we perhaps need to come back. Um, would that qualify as a minor amendment? That sorry, on. Hopefully, should be sure. Uh, um, we could try and draft the resolution around it, but if there's support from the committee for making that statement, then you're the ones who are going to hold you, you, Mr. Chair, to account. So, yeah. I think, yeah, if you're comfortable with that, we can do it that way. Is there an existing resolution that gives the discretion to the chair to do? My editorial right. amendments, or yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy uh, yeah. just to, to leave it for officials to add some paragraphs, is what Celia said. And it's just a matter of whether um, our officers feel there's sufficient room existing to do that, or I can soon draft up a quick amendment if it's your preference. Where were we? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Chair, look, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with the uh, notes on the table that we could cover with under the delegation uh, oh, contemplated yeah. resolution eight if, if, if yeah. the chair and the deputy are comfortable with that. Right, any further comments? Um, Councillor O'Neill Stevens, then Councillor Dale. Yeah, first, just to say, appreciate the update done to the environmental impact problem statement. I think that captures well the feedback from the last workshop. My question is around uh, the tables on page 54 and 56, where um, under the subsidised activities um, by activity class, TDC has a walking and cycling improvements line, which Nelson doesn't have. Um, and just curious as to why that is. Reese, I think that one might be for you, Ian. Yes, thank you. Um, 
through the chair. So Nelson City there is walking and cycling projects contained with, uh, hang on, just let me find it. Um, we chose not to separate out the local road improvements um, into different you know, different categorizations, but it does include walking and cycling within it. I'm just struggling right now to find exactly that line. Um, so maybe if we can go to another question and I'll <laughs> hunt for it. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that would be the case and was just wondering if that could at least be footnoted um, within that table itself, because I think it will give people a shock. Um, if you're looking at the uh, yeah, just back to what said about the uh, we are just all time at the end always will sustain us the numbers going across. And the pass, if you add those numbers up like I did last night, ain't anywhere near $496 million. So it, because this is going to be a public document and people are going to read it, would those yearly totals be amended somehow so that they get somewhere close to $496 million, please? The ones down the bottom aren't far away, but the top two um, don't come close. Up oh, through the chair, I suspect that's because it's missing year seven through to 10. Um, they are uh, so maybe a summary column or something like that that summarizes that will make it tally up. Uh, Councillor Ford, we do have something. Thank you. Yes, Stuart. Reese, thanks for your report. You mentioned and made mention um, about fifty-five million um, for the land transport um, significance policy um, back twice, five years ago, if I recall. And now I want to ask, you know, what was the criteria or the methodology of um, the proposed 15 mil million you're suggesting now? This is 4.15 in your report. Uh, through the chair. So, yes, I, I, I said that I thought that that 5 million was put in 12 years ago when the first regional land transport plan was drafted. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there was a huge amount of science applied to that five million back then, but what I do remember back then was we had this funding class called um, minor improvements, and it was one million dollars, and we thought we needed to separate it some distance from that. Mm. Um, so we've had twelve years since then. Again, not a massive amount of science was gone into that fifteen million dollar number, but I do note that the low cost, low risk of that minor improvements has now doubled to two million dollars. Um, and it really it was just looking at the kinds of values in the table and you know what is a significant pro project in the New Zealand context now. And we thought fifteen million was the right kind of number. Happy to take any counter views on that. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, is someone with, uh, prepared to move the resolutions with those two of them? Oh, sounds like that. Sorry. Sorry, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, I'm just wanting to get some clarification about the on horizon activities table. Um, I applaud the um, point to have these uh, projects in so that we signal that if we get additional funding or some sort of other funding that we can have them. But is there any sort of priority around those projects? Um, and the last, um, the in particular, I'm thinking about the State Highway 60 um, intersections on McShane and Pew Road um, and Lansdowne Road, which are significantly difficult intersections. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, of the history of that, but um, they've been on the horizon for a while, and I'm not sure how much of it um, has taken account of the change in the original land use. Originally, it was owned mixed business and industrial, and now, of course, it's residential. Um, and there's been significant pressure, especially on that McShane Road Pew intersection. Um, so, yeah, what is my question? Um, 
So is there going to be some clarification about which projects are going to be priority in that area? Uh, through the chair, no, there's been no prioritisation applied to this table. This table was developed by looking at what had already been proposed by Tasman, by Wakakotahi and by Nelson, and what was the what was the gap in the reasonably recent transport studies and investigations that have been done that made recommendations, and those recommendations had been endorsed by the Wakakotahi board and endorsed or approved by the council, and what were those projects that were missing? Um, so no, no prioritisation applied. Thank you. Um, does somebody of mine to move the resolutions? Um, move Councillor oh, Dallas. Sorry, can we also do RPTP? Or are we separating them out? I wasn't going to. Did you want them separate? I've got, no, I've just got some questions on RPTP. Oh, yeah. Have we got that as a separate item? Or? No. No. Oh, no. one, one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Neil Stevens. Yeah, just in terms of page 87 of the report, um, looking at sort of that interim period post our one year review. Um, sorry, I'm just finding it myself. In terms of that stage one, we were talking about the implementation of minor network adjustments. Uh, I think it'd be useful just to get a sense of what minor is in that context. The chair. I'll just uh, ask Madeline to maybe speak to that. We'll just brief her since she was out of the room for a moment. Yeah, so, so just in terms of um, stage one of the RPTP, um, where it talks about implementation of minor network adjustments identified in the 12 months review. It's just a sense of what scale we're talking to. Um, you know, it sort of identifies improving reliability, meeting capacity demands, increasing geographic coverage and supporting mode shift. That can can be quite a large remit. And so interested maybe in terms of a numbers or, or overall scale of what we'd be looking at within those minor improvements. Through the chair, um, the minor improvements would be um, probably improvements to address the feedback that we're already um, seeing some signs of. So those are the routes that, um, uh, such as um, the extension through Artify, perhaps that there's been some um, feedback on, um, just just things that um, are not going to be additional, not not new services. I can't, it's probably easier to say what they're not. <laughs> it wouldn't be a new a new route entirely. It wouldn't be um, significant um, additions of services. Um, it would just be adjustments to meet capacity on the routes. So perhaps if if we're finding that um, some services are oversubscribed, we might be able to put on uh, more buses or, or additional peak trips. It might only be one or two um, a day or something like that. So not nothing um, that's going to cost a lot <laughs> is basically the answer there. Yeah, so I, I guess one of the key bits of feedback at least I've been receiving is particularly around um, start times of, uh, of the services. Just would that be considered under that? But one of the questions in part two is just how are we managing sort of the um, budget allocation for this as yet unknown improvement to services? Um, and and to, to answer the first part, yes, that those sorts of extra trips um, would be a, a considered a minor adjustment. Um, they're not a, they're not going to be a big cost to to the councils to add an extra trip um, at the start of the day or at the end of the day. Um, as for the budgeting, um, I know Nelson has set aside a a sum um, and it's long term plan to to fund these, um, but it, it it's not. Um, it, it's yeah, it, we've we've got it covered, but um, it's it's just sort of a a a, a, a backup, really, because we're already at the stage where we um 
um, have made the step change. So it is, is not considered to be a big expense. So through the chair, what I can add is, and it really is minor tweaks and, and adjustments. So, you know, I just want to just want to clarify. So um, changing the start times and the end times, and that, that may not in itself be a, a minor change. It may be, um, you know, if we're looking at, say, for example, um, say 15 minutes, that, that may not be a minor change because you may need additional bus drivers, Etc. Especially when you couple that with maybe an extra thing at the end, we, we're talking about minor tweaks, um, and we've always said that um, we need to run for 12 months. And as we're going through this, we're accumulating things where we can 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 tweak. And Madeline is actually dealing and working with SBL to find out how we can make those minor tweaks work under the existing contract. But anything that has an implication to the contract in terms of even extending routes. We just need to, um, and I've said on many occasions, we just need to take a breather, assess that after 12 months and see where we go. So we are talking about really minor tweaks. Thank you. Uh, and I, I guess just my my reflection would be um, of what I'm flagging here and what, I, what I'm comfortable with where we're at right now, but what I have a sort of lingering concern about is making sure that we don't let the success of this network get away on us by failing to keep up with the demands and requirements for it, particularly at the early planning process of making sure that we are accounting for where we might need uh, increased frequency on peak services earlier than 2027, um, because the numbers so far are painting a really positive picture, um, and it's just how we can continue to make sure that this is a service delivering um, to the people who are really loving using it. Okay. Um, yeah, just in, uh, on page um, um, 88, I think it's the same similar topic, stage two, um, the uh, bullet point one, two, three, four, five, community transport su support for Golden Bay under stage two. Well, this has been traversed for a couple of years, and um, we, I think we've established that community transport support is not a worthwhile strategy because you can't get find somebody who's going to volunteer to drive a bus over the hill and wait around and take the bus back again as a volunteer. So um, there, a lot of work has been done, and Jane has um, managed to um, get um, a system of working with um, the um, commercial providers, which is the only way it's actually going to work. And so I'm just questioning, I mean, it would be fine to change this under delegated, the delegated small changes, but I'd, I would like to see community transport support for Golden Bay taken out because you know, maybe we could say something like, to work with um, commercial providers or wording to that effect, which is what we're doing at the moment with the subsidy for locals to be able to um, travel because they've got, there are tourists there as well. So we need to distinguish between the two. Thank you. Any further comments? If not, it's someone of a mind to move the resolution. I think you already had Councillor Dowler, hadn't you? Or was that yeah, you? Moved and uh, seconded by Councillor Neil Stevens. Any further discussion before I put the resolution? If not, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against the resolution is carried. Thank you. We'll now move on to the public transport update. Uh, Madeline, page 142, Councillors. Uh, kia ora. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will take the um, public transport report as read. Um, I would just like to um, highlight the key points of this update, which are that uh, patronage has continued to grow. Thank um, you. I might just get you to pull that speaker really close. 
Can you hear me? Notice the ones yeah. behind you are struggling to hear. Okay, sorry. Um, I would just like to highlight that um, we do still see growth on the network, the eBus network. Um, November showed total boardings of 83,865 passengers. So that's an increase of um, 5,367 passengers um, from the preceding month. Um, all of the routes have had an increase across the board. Uh, route 5, which is the Motueka route, um, has had the biggest increase in patronage, followed by Route 4, which is the Brook to the Airport route, and Route 6, the Wakefield service. Um, so, yeah, really pleasing results um, for, for the eBus network um, for the first four months. Um, adult passengers make up 30.7% of all passengers on the bus, and then 37.4% um, of passengers are in the groups of um, five to 18 year olds. So those are fares that are subsidized by the Community Connect scheme. Um, in terms of revenue, we are working on a dashboard um, that we will be able to present to um, this committee going forward. Um, I have a colleague who's assisting me with that. So that's still work in progress. Um, I can report that the monthly re revenue, and this is just the ticket sales alone it was $78,000 excluding GST for November. Um, at this stage, we haven't had the um, um, the concessions through from Wakakotahi that will um, supplement that revenue for us. Um, I'd also just like to address um, the points coming out of the last um, meeting when uh, we um, mentioned the potential change of the conditions of carriage. Um, that hasn't been able to be progressed for this meeting, but um, we will be working on um, drafting some term, um, some trial terms um, to trial a new policy for the animals on buses. And similarly, the total mobility project, um, we wish to defer that because the central government is currently re reviewing the total mobility scheme. So that might have some impact on that um, work. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Um, Councillor Neil Stevens. Thank you for it again. Lisa, question or a comment around the total mobility and delaying that. I, I'm pretty concerned about doing that. That review is not expected until the end of next year. I'm still burnt by MOT's Accessible Streets package, which was consulted on in 2020 and we're still waiting on. Um, and the feedback we're getting feedback now of people being challenged to use public transport over private taxis because of um that we're not applying total mobility in this space i don't want to leave that another year so i just want to to flag that early yeah. any comment Madeline? um if, if well i i guess if the committee would like to direct us to, to continue with that review earlier that's certainly something we could um, keep on with, yeah. Uh, Council, uh, Mayor Smith, then Councillor Courtney. Uh, yeah, Councillor Courtney. Oh, Councillor Courtney. Thank you. Chair Stewart. Madeline, thanks for your report. You mentioned patronage, and I'm looking at 3.3 .3 here on page 144. But you know, and I'd like you to speak to this, the one that really warmed, warmed my heart was the point here you make in 3.3, .3, a total of 43.3% of all boardings were taken by passengers aged 18 or younger. Uh, now that, I think, there's a message there because they're our future and I just think it bodes well for our transport system when you've got jolly near, you know, over 43% under 18 supporting. Would you like to speak to that just for a second? Because I, I think it's significant. Thank you, through the chair. Yes, I would agree. It, it is certainly significant. And um, yeah, I think this is really a, a, a real success for the region that we have got these young people um, using the bus um, and, and um, be becoming aware of the importance that public transport can have and giving them independence um, and the lack of reliance on cars. I think it's great to get these young people on, on board early. 
um, uh, it's very pleasing. Thank you. Mayor Smith. My first question is how does the revenue that's reported on page 144 compare, oh, 145, sorry, compare with the budget? Are we ahead of budget in the amount of revenue that we're receiving from passengers on the e bus on budget, behind budget? I can't answer that directly at the moment, I'm afraid. Otherwise, I would have reported on that. Um, at this stage, I would have thought overall because patronage is ahead of um, expectation. expectation. The revenue will be too, but um, we have had um, the um, Community Connect extension scheme come in, which means that all of the child fares are free when they board, and that's subsidised by central government. So we haven't quite done that reconciliation yet of what the total um, revenue taking that into account would be. I'm struggling to understand a couple of numbers on page 143 on patronage. And that is, when I look at the late bus, and look, uh, this is not being at all negative about the very positive increase in patronage on routes one, on routes one to seven. But as I read both the on-demand service and the late bus service, that actually the utilisation and patronage has declined. Am I correct? That is in August, the late night bus was 273 and it's declined through to 261 with a bit up and down. Actually, yes, you're, you're correct. So the number at the bottom of the table showing an increase in patronage and boardings under both the late buses and the on-demand service are incorrect, as are the percentages. It's just month on month. So um, from October to November, there were very small increases on those two services. Oh, they see. are it's fairly not... static, though. I, I do is, take your point. That is there. The bit that's worrying me is I'd love to see an economic analysis on the on-demand service. When I look at 111 journeys over a complete month, that's averaging three journeys a day. Um, that is, uh, and it's not to take away the massive success of the, you know, 83,000 passengers that were getting on the main e-bus service, uh, but getting only three passengers a day on the on-demand service is raising alarm bells for me. Uh, and so I'd love to know, well, how much is the on-demand bus costing per month? Uh, if we're getting only about, you know, 111 journeys, how much is that working out? Are we sure that that service, and it could mean two things, public aren't used to it, and we've got to change our marketing around it or some sort of a, a earlier review, uh, but I'd be interested uh, for our next regional transport meeting for a bit more information uh, on that. That is the one area of the service that I don't think we can describe as a success. Certainly, I can provide that information for um, next month's or in the next meeting. Yeah, um, yeah. We have just conducted a um, user survey for on-demand customers, which is going to inform some marketing um, for us. Um, the patronage for the on-demand service is slightly lower than it was for the Stoke Loop services that used to cover the area. However, um, what we can't quantify is how many residents in Stoke are now using Route 2 which travels from Stoke via Nayland Road. Um, yes. And that, so what, that's something we, we, we haven't been able to quantify how many of those um, previous Stoke loop, loop users are using that service as well. However, um, certainly I'll take, take that on board and we'll, we'll provide some more um, numbers next time. Were there um, uh, projections when uh, we set the new service up for the level of patronage on the on-demand bus? Not that I have, um, not that I have seen. But we didn't. We didn't do separate projections for each route. We're just talking a global service look. I can't answer that question because um, I wasn't here, but I can certainly find out. Um, I haven't seen it, seen any numbers. Time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I actually got on the bus. Came across to a meeting in Nelson just to see how it was going, actually, to, as well as the fact that it fitted the timetable. I hopped on in Tasman and uh, the bus had left Motawaka. There were 22 people on the bus when I hopped on board. 
when you walk down the bus as a councillor towards all the pensioners sitting in the back of the bus, the comments <laughs> were really cool. What's the councillor doing on here? What are you doing on the bus, mate? <laughs> uh, do, you have to, do you have to disclose whether you're eligible for the pensioner? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but um, just a couple of comments. But all I said to them, I said, well, it actually had complaints about you lot whenever you take the bus, so I'm actually here to see for myself how you actually behave. <laughs> <laughs> that shut one or two of them up. And, uh, that was very good. And by the time we got to uh, Richmond here, when I hopped off for a delay, there was 29 people on board. I was actually wrapped to see how people hopped on and and, and were, were enjoying it. Comments out the window, did you see that? Did you see this? You know, So they're not driving. They're up high. They can see where what's going on. They were all gold card people, most of them. So there would be no money coming in, which is unfortunate. But anyway, that's the way it is. But yeah, then I hopped on a bus here and I went into Nelson. There was seven of us hopped on here across the road. And by the time we got into Nelson, there was 31 on board, I think, picking up all the way through. And um, did the meeting come out? And it was quite interesting because I got on the bus at called the three. I thought this would be interesting. And I went in via the hospital and I come out via Tahuna. I was picking and choosing. Wow, the school kids, amazing. <laughs> Little buggers hopping on and hopping off, and <laughs> I don't know how the bus driver got with it because you know I watched one group of kids get on at the school just outside the school, and they went about three crossings, and they all got off again. So obviously that's the way they get home, and they probably come the way. I reckon it was great because they're not on the footpath, they're not at risk on anything at crossings or anything like that. They're on the bus, they're yeah. coming off. It was very interesting what they did with their scooters. Obviously they take their scooters to school, and they all get put in the luggage area. And some of them were hopping on before and uh, obviously getting off. Well, that scooter was at the bottom. So all these scooters had to come off and then the scooter come out and then all the scooters had to be put back on. It was great. I was, I was really refreshed when I got back out here to, to think about it. I didn't try and count the numbers because it would have been 70 or 80 hopping on and off all the way through. But it was still a, quite a group that we got off out here, probably I'd say 10 or 15, still on the bus when we arrived here when I jumped out. I didn't go back to... Uh, is when I hitched the ride back with my wife and took my car up on the way home. But no, it was a real good experience. And I really, really um, commend the bus service and the drivers and everything. It was great. Thank you. With that, you were happy to move the report then? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking for that. Yeah, so do we have a seconder? Yes. Uh, Emma, thank you. So I put the resolution that we receive the report. All those in favour will say aye. Aye. Against. The resolution is carried. Now we'll move to the Waka Katari MCTA update. Emma, that's you. You've got 14 you. minutes. <laughs> I'll rattle through it. Um, so, here we go. Um, so, uh, this has been obviously slightly superseded. Um, so, um, what will happen from here is that um, the Minister will obviously consider a revised GPS. We're expecting it to be considerably shorter um, and uh, he will then pay that to Cabinet and we'll get a new draft uh, to put out and that will go to consultation. Uh, but it should give us some really clear signals um, as we get the... Um, RLTP consultation feedback and we will then also have to redo our investment prioritisation method if there's substantial change um, and we are also preparing a new ship so we are anticipating that that will change as well um, and uh, you're already well ahead of the game in terms of making sure that you're including a wide range of activities uh, to be prepared for those changes and any potential changes to other funding opportunities such as uh, provincial funds and so on. Um, so things that are still um, happening in our national programs, obviously the Streets for People projects um, that are ongoing and uh, you've got a number in this um, category. And we are seeing um, these types of activities picked up and used in, in areas they haven't previously been used. I know that uh, Tauranga have picked up some of these technologies and, and approaches and uh, been able to then 
uh, roll out similar activities and it's very cost effective way of working. Um, so these are all in the current financial year, so they're all due to be completed by June. Um, now, safety cameras. Um, now, I briefed you previously that we are taking over the safety cameras from police and we'll be increasing both the number and type of safety cameras. And um, one of the... Uh, First types of new cameras will be point-to-point -point cameras. We already have one operating in Tamaki Makara, Auckland. And um, this is an area that we're very interested in your views. Um, we can certainly start um, putting them onto state highways in this region if you'd like them um, in particular locations. They're used all around the world and they are very effective at, at maintaining safe speeds um, that's signposted so people know they're there. Um, and in areas where you're seeing significant growth and um, we're still getting uh, crashes that are causing harm, then they can be really useful. Um, so a, a corridor like State Highway 60 would be one that we might look at on the State Highway, uh, particularly around the Appleby area. Um, but we could also, um, we're also interested in local roads that you might be interested in. So um, that will be uh, something we can uh, consider. We'll be looking at red light cameras and um, eventually the mobile phone and seatbelt detection uh, safety cameras as well. And then police will continue to do additional speed monitoring uh, using their radar technology. Um, so it's it's a part of that safe system that um, uh, we'll be uh, continuing to implement um, as we go. And they... Sure. Just, just quickly, when uh, NZTA takes over these safety cameras and say, for instance, you put one on a stretch like um, State Highway 60 and Appleby, mm -hmm. um, this is a first in the sense that NZTA is the owner of the camera. Is the ticketing done by police or by NZTA? So you detect a, a, a traveller, that bad bugger Barry, he's doing, you know, an 80k, 85k over the speed limit. Does, this, does the ticket come from NZTA or does it still come from police and how does that work? So it, it transfers to us as a regulatory function. Uh, so, um, so we will then enforce as well. Um, there is an intersection with police in some aspects of this um, so that we will continue to work very closely with them. But the uh, administration, so we already have the ability to do that. We just haven't yet. So, for example, in Auckland, we are monitoring and telling people when we are identifying that they have exceeded the point-to-point -point speed limit. Um, and then next year we'll move to uh, sending out and enforcing those tickets. So there is a new unit being set up with an NZTA for the purposes of now a speed ticketing function separate yes. to the police? Yes, transfers to us. Sorry, I just wanted clarity. Uh, just a question from yourself. So I noticed the other day there's more cameras than had previously been down here at the Richmond Lights. So are they now NZTA cameras or...? Uh, so, it, are they safety? I, I don't know what if it, they could be safety cameras or they could be traffic monitoring cameras that we have near speed and near traffic lights that enable us to monitor what's happening at those sites. So, uh, so a safety camera is in a box and uh, these are just standard the radar light. with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very much know what they are, do they're, they're just the stand, just they're not in a box as such, they're just around. I expect there for um, traffic monitoring. Yeah, so where we have uh, traffic lights, we usually will have a camera that can enable the operators to look at what's happening so that when we get unusual traffic flows, they can override the algorithms on the, 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 right, the lights. Yeah, I expect that's what they yeah. have. There did seem to be more than Council Dower. We will we'll be able to have just a static speed camera in certain areas because we've got one hotspot now here. We also have several intersections coming onto that road. And if you have one there and one there, you're not picking up the guy that's coming in mid 
but drift them burning down the road. So you, you, you. Yeah, there's there's a range of options that we have, and um, the cameras can carry out all of the functions. Yeah. Um, when we have point to points, um, obviously they're signposted so that people would would understand that they're entering that point to point area. But those cameras can also be set to run as statics. Cool. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, Emma, I'm just curious, uh, who will be deciding on the priority areas for cameras? Um, I'm thinking about which particular roads will be selected and which intersections would be selected for use of things like the red light cameras, and who will have input into that? So in terms of the... Um, the this, um, the current speed management planning uh, under the role allows for councils to identify where they would like them to be, uh, but the decision sits with the regulatory part of what could Thank you. Carry on, Emma. Oh, oh Councillor Courtney, sorry. Well, I'm, a, I'm like to know too, just Emma, how many cameras we have throughout New Zealand, these type of cameras, these safety cameras, and you say they're going to be increased. And I got the impression, might have been just your wording, significantly. So what numbers are we looking at? Currently there's under 200 and we're looking at going to 800. And in Nelson? I, I don't know the specific oh, by oh. region. Thank you. Now you can carry on, Emma. Um, so... Um, here we just providing an update that the interim speed management plan is still uh, sitting uh, with the speed management committee. So we're just awaiting uh, their completed review of that um, and also whether there are any changes to the role identified by the new government. Um, we have also um, released some more videos um, on rightcar.govt.nz, which is the site you can go to and firstly, obviously, put in the number plate of any vehicle and get its safety rating. Uh, and the videos then explain what different safety features do and, and why they're important and what you should look for. Uh, and this is um, something that's really important because we know that the, the higher the stars, the less um, uh, trauma people experience when they do have a crash. Um, and so with um, we've obviously done our work with ACC that we do every spring, trying to ensure that our motorcycling uh, community is refreshing themselves when they break out the, the gear again after winter and uh, just refreshing all of those key things that help keep them safe. And we're also looking at um, the work that uh, we can do to prepare people for their summer journeys, and uh, we have um, we've had some really sig significant and serious events with road workers being uh, threatened, abused, including having firearms presented at them, which is completely unacceptable. And uh, so we're really trying to help inform people about what they're doing, about why that traffic management's there, and the importance of of looking after the people who are doing that work so that uh, we can get it completed in a safe way and get people back on their normal journeys. Uh, we also have our journey planners, which um, are available on the website for people to see where the, we get the greatest congestion on popular routes uh, so that people can help to plan to either um, time their journey, leave earlier or later and avoid that. Um, and then we'll have all of the normal uh, reminders in partnership with New Zealand Police. Um, I noted we've been doing a, a big uh, joint activity down in Canterbury with uh, the road policing team down there, and over 600 tickets for incorrect restraints or not wearing restraints. So there's still some really significant non-compliance on some of those things that have such a major impact on road safety. So. We're keen. I went out with police in Wellington a couple of weeks ago. They stopped over a thousand drivers, but had seven still over the limit, including some quite significantly over the limit people who are about to head out onto our motorway. So um, 
that's uh, uh, again something you can expect. I, I think I'm doing some time with your local road policing team tomorrow morning, so we'll see how well behaved the local community is. <laughs> And in the region, um, we've obviously um, uh, have a huge number of things that are uh, still happening underway across the network, uh, including obviously the interim speed management plan, which we're awaiting, uh, the ongoing work to look at the vegetation control around um, State Highway 6 and, and what the best options are. Um, the State Highway 60 right turn bay at Hori Estuary, um, work right across um, all of the um, region, regional um, uh, emergency responders and uh, councils and others about how we plan for and manage the disruption that we see from time to time on State Highway 6. Um, uh, the Whakatū Drive shared path upgrade. Um, uh, we've had a huge amount of work done on that, getting those detailed designs uh, to the almost final stage. So uh, that has been uh, a big piece of work and I think that will help us to get to, to a, a solution, design solution that, that has taken into account um, all of the different factors in that section. And uh, the State Highway 60 safety improvements, the Ruby Bay Bypass medium barrier, uh, we're now looking uh, at getting to construction in February so that we can complete that by the end of June. That may be slightly delayed. Um, it's taken a wee while just to get the final approvals through. So, uh, but it's certainly looking to happen later in the summer season so we can get it all in place. And uh, State Highway 6 to no pedestrian improvements, um, you'll recall this is part of the Nelson Future Access Plan and is looking at how do we reduce the severance caused by State Highway 6 through to Hunanui through the installation of some uh, refuges that enable people to pause as they cross uh, when they're in the median part of the road and uh, provide more sites that people can move safely across. And our team has been out talking to our businesses and residents in the areas uh, adjacent to those proposed crossings. It was quite a bit. Um, it was. Councillor Dale has got a question. <laughs> yeah, just our safety improvement, the barrier down the middle of the road on the bypass. February to June is actually smack on the horticulture apple kiwi fruit harvest session. So traffic management will be priority there to keep the Moving yeah, so so that's a big part of what we're looking at, and um, the team has obviously we had a number of different projects now that we've had to look at uh, detours and which way we flow those and so on. So we'll we'll certainly be working with industry on that one. Uh, Mayor Smith, you asked Emma for feedback on your safety camera proposals. Mm -hmm. um, my feedback would be there will be strong community support for them if they are focused on safety, not revenue gathering. That is, uh, I would like to see the, um, the NZTA and the council staff work on those sections where we know we've got black spots and we've got accidents, where we need to get speed under control, and that if they are well justified on those grounds, I think there'll be community support. The temptation sometimes when agencies are under revenue pressure is there'll be spots where you may have uh, where you've got large volumes of vehicles and you can clip lots of people um, on our main highways where there isn't a substantive safety issue. So as long as the, the, the siting is prioritised on the basis of safety, I think you would get good community support and certainly I'd be supportive. So for instance, we all know that Appleby State Highway 60 uh, stretch has got a good one. That's, that's an obvious um, candidate for it. If you look at 800 nationwide, we had our share and that's potentially, you know, between 10 and 20 um, uh, cameras around the region. And like I say, the, the focus that, that should... We'll move to that over a number of years. I, oh, I realise that. <laughs> but if, in my view, the order in which you do them and the priority of choosing the sites should be those areas uh, where we know we're having accidents.
just to follow on from me, that I know that we've uh, with local community councils and the local police, we've got them in Brightwater, Wakefield and Murchison. And as they're for safety, as he says, the communities are supportive and the community councils have actually helped fund them. So maybe they won't have to do that now. <laughs> so, yeah, anything else on that slide before uh, we carry on? Um, now, here's um, uh, a really good news story. By Christmas, uh, the summer program for... Um, the state highway maintenance operations will be 97% complete. So we've had a huge amount of work. You will have seen it. Um, you know, we've had Birds Hill and, and various other places. Um, and uh, so the team has pulled out all the stops. And obviously we haven't had the significant uh, resource disruption that we had last year with uh, the closure of State Highway 6 and redeploying everyone to that project. Um, so the team's got in there and worked really hard to get that done and completed before the summer season. Um, and um, we've obviously had uh, the closures also on the Tuck Hill uh, to enable the, the work to be done under full closure, which is uh, providing a really efficient way of working on such a, a narrow and windy section of the road. And um, the Dillows Brough work will be also completed by Christmas, which has taken quite a bit. Now we say cliff stabilisation phase one, we have identified the need for some ongoing uh, stabilisation work that we'll, we'll continue to do. Um, we've remediated the former culvert that needed some work and completed the rye saddle slip um, that was over the passing lane there. So. Um, that was a significant amount of work um, all completed. And uh, uh, the, I might just get you go back because actually I just realised that that picture is um, Delos Bluff. I just had a question. So you're thinking there'll be more work carrying on next year. This must be becoming a huge um, money hole, sinkhole for money. How much have you spent there to date? Have you any idea? I don't have that on the tip of my fingers, um, but and this is one of those challenging faces. Obviously, you can see here that, that we've got that uh, cliff site with it, the exposed rock. And by going in and doing more stabilisation work, we're actually looking to um, intervene in ways that mean we don't have the dramatic points of failure that we've had previously. Um, and I think that's where the team working up there is, has been able to actually identify the opportunity to do that, which uh, is is really positive. Yeah, I think I read somewhere and it's on the order of fourteen million you've either spent or budgeting. Yeah, well, we take project. the two sites that would definitely be the likely. The, yeah, the, yeah, and that's what uh, a lot of people don't realise. There's two sites: the underslip here and the rocks are long to the poor to the left. So. Yeah, it's quite a challenge, and the, most people look at it as one site. It's actually two quite yeah, different projects. Yeah, we've been managing so. it as one site. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, two quite different uh, repair and uh, stabilisation processes. Uh, which so. takes us nicely into our resilience programme. Um, <laughs> there we have it all again. Um, so... Um, the government had already provided for advanced resilience funding for the region, and so we are now working through investigating um, specific sites um, that you'll be familiar with, um, uh, f uh, ranging from the, the Whangamaas through uh, Birds Hill, um, 63, 65, 6, and also, it's not on that one because it's possibly outside your direct region, uh, but the um, the wash as well, um, which is a site that uh, has caused problems in the past. And so all of those are under investigation and looking to put in the, the type of investment that enables us to make those sections more resilient to future events. And I think that's us. Right. A few minutes over time, so any concluding questions, uh, Councillor Dan? I'd just like to make a comment. Like we had a public presentation today, and it was absolutely great, but one of the slides that came up was some cyclists in Nelson, some cyclists in the country overseas. 
two cyclists and Nelson were wearing cycle helmets. The two people overseas didn't have cycle helmets anywhere near them, and I don't think that's a good presentation. Put in front of us, um, we've recommended our staff, made sure that we're, all our stuff is right. I know that that country probably doesn't have the need for cycle helmets, but we do, and I'd like to see it in all situations. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Thank you, Emma, for that presentation. Appreciate that, as per normal. Uh, if there's nothing else, I think we can move to the closing character there. Uh, kia heka te korero. Let the discussions be lifted. Kia waiti, waitia, kia mama, te manawa, o te tangata. Clear away and ease the hearts of people. Kia o ki te ara motato e oranei. Keep focus on the path of life. Ki rongo, ki ronga. Peace is upheld. Ki tina. Say yes. Huie, tai kia. Bind together, and so it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for your attendance and enthusiastic input. And wish you all a merry Christmas and happy New Year. And look forward to seeing you all in the new.